We go to care for the latest on escalating violence and European-backed unity talks that began Wednesday from CCTV's Roe Ruttenberg. And Roe, of course, the violence is escalating. We have those European-backed talks uh, which took place uh, in Kiev, but without the pro-Russian separatists. So what's the latest? Indeed, and those talks kicked off here Wednesday afternoon. They were headed by uh, Ukraine's president, the uh, acting president, the prime minister. Uh, in attendance were two former uh, presidents of Ukraine, one from the east, one from the west, uh, representatives from a number of different regions here, including regions from the east, but notably, as you mentioned, no representatives from the separatist groups. And that's one of the big criticisms that people have had of these roundtable talks, which are due to be copied in a number of cities around Ukraine, is that they simply don't include the very people who are at the source of all of this tension. Now, the prime minister insisting that these roundtables will be used to discuss issues of decentralization, sensitive topics like culture, language, and history, uh, but again, refusing to interact with what the government calls terrorists, uh, refusing to speak with people at the barrel of a gun. Those, uh, that's the position being held here by authorities in Kiev. Now, Roy, do these talks have the backing of Russia? It's quite interesting because this was all backed by the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, which presented the idea of these roundtable talks to Russia, to Ukraine, to the United States, and to the European Union. And the response from Russia was uh, quite optimistic that this would be a way uh, uh, to get the East involved. And it, of course, wants the voices, as it says, of the East heard. It is concerned, from what I understand from the Russian ambassador to the OSCE, speaking in Austria on Thursday, that uh, these talks aren't as inclusive as they should be, and that, of course, is an allusion uh, to the fact that they don't include the separatist groups. But Russia is quite keen to see uh, this uh, conflict resolved through words. That's at least according to uh, Russian officials. Ukraine was slightly more skeptical of the OSCE-backed talks, and that's because it wants to see that it is the one leading national dialogue talks and not a European and uh, North American organization. Right, Roy, and as we reported earlier, those disputed talks or referendums were held in eastern Ukraine last weekend, despite the fact that the referendum actually made no uh, mention of joining Russia. The results uh, prompted some pro-Russian separatists in Donetsk to appeal for inclusion in the Russian Federation. And in fact, we now have a new body that's been formed, the Supreme Council. What can you tell us about that? Indeed, and it's all quite tricky, that uh, Supreme Council, the so-called Donetsk People's Republic, or DPR for shorthand, adopting a constitution, now saying that it will hold its own elections, the people's election, in September. This is all quite complicated. If you'll recall, Russia uh, annexed uh, uh, Crimea. It's still not recognized internationally, but it did so two days after that referendum was held in Crimea. Well, it's been several days since people in the East voted in those referendums, again, referendums not recognized by Ukraine or much of the international community, but voted uh, for a rather um, a vague question talking about greater autonomy. Well, immediately hours after those results, the leaders of the separatist groups announcing not only independence, but saying that they are appealing uh, to join the Russian Federation. Uh, it's interesting to know that there hasn't been uh, an annexation, uh, if you will, by Russia as quickly as we saw from Crimea. So that perhaps is a reflection of Russia's uh, uh, position on Donetsk and Luhansk. And if you recall, before the vote last week, on Wednesday, President Vladimir Putin from Russia appealed to uh, the separatist groups in the East to postpone their vote. Uh, they, of course, chose to ignore that request and proceeded with the vote. Roy, the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov is warning that uh, Ukraine is very close to civil war. He said that they are on the brink of civil war. What is the situation in the East right now? It's difficult to tell, and that is, a, uh, that is a statement that we've heard before from the Russians, who are obviously closely monitoring what is happening here, and some argue uh, would be to their benefit to see a full-out uh, civil war in Ukraine. That's an argument made against the Russians. Uh, Ukraine specifically believes that they're actually fueling uh, the tension in the East uh, for that reason. Uh, the, ten the situation now is, uh, for example, in Donetsk, the DPR has given an ultimatum to Ukraine's military to leave within 24 hours uh, key areas that they're still in in Donetsk region. Otherwise, they will face the consequences, namely uh, the military military's equipment will be destroyed. That's what we heard from leaders in the DPR. The Ukrainian officials appear to be brushing that off, saying they're open to dialogue, but not 
to ultimatums. And in fact, they are still surrounding the besieged city of Sloviansk, a city of about 120,000 people. They've been there for weeks, and they say they're entering their final stage of their, quote, anti-terrorist operation. We've heard that before, but Ukraine seems committed to ending this with force if it has to, but wants to actually bring the parties to the dialogue, again, only without weapons, it says. Uh, Roy, we've just got a little bit of time left. Preparations taking place right now for that election that's going to take place in 10 days' time on May 25th. What are you seeing of those preparations? And can elections really take place in the east of the country, where, as you've been telling us, there's a great deal of instability? Indeed, in the ballots just being printed here today in Kiev, we saw some of those uh, going out here, uh, getting ready. Uh, the word from uh, the East, from the DPR, from the leaders of that so-called uh, independent republic saying they won't allow elections there to proceed. Ukraine, of course, very much saying that it wants everyone to be able to vote, that it wants these elections to be recognized internationally as legitimate. There will be uh, uh, several uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of observers here, more than 1,000 just from the OSCE, its biggest election. Of course, Ukraine hasn't had many presidents, only four in its uh, short uh, uh, history of independence. So this is a very important election, referred to by Barack Obama, uh, uh, by U.S. officials as one of the most important historic elections. I'm sorry, not by Barack Obama, by Joe Biden, uh, the U.S. vice president when he was here. And many people looking to that May 25th date as a, a possible part of the resolution of this tension. Of course, we'll be following that closely, but uh, uh, the parties here keen to allow as many people to vote and saying that even if the elections can't be held in various parts that, uh, that are blocked for security reasons from uh, p enabling people to vote, that they will proceed full steam ahead with this historic election. Roy, one other question. This is an economic one. Russia is demanding something like $1.6 billion from Ukraine for an outstanding gas bill. It's threatened to cut off supplies if it doesn't get that money. But now there's been a development. On Wednesday, Gunter Oettinger, who's a German politician, he's actually the European Commissioner for Energy, he said a price for Russian gas uh, could be agreed on with Ukraine by the end of May. Uh, that's in an effort to avoid a disruption in supplies. Uh, is there optimism that this could come together, that we might stave off the supplies being cut off to Ukraine? And I'm not sure if you remember the film Jerry Maguire. There was that famous line, show me the money. And that's what Russia is saying here. A lot of this tension is not just uh, about language, about uh, land, about politics, but has to do with gas. And of course, Russia is a big supplier of gas to Ukraine, uh, issuing this week a bill of $1.66 billion that it wants paid by the start of June before it will supply gas in advance. That's on top of the billions that are already owed uh, to Russia's gas company, Gazprom. Now, Ukraine saying, we're happy to pay, we're happy to show you the money, but we want to stick with the original price. Uh, Ukraine saying that Russia upped the price by some 80% over what uh, is currently being paid by other European countries saying that's specifically unfair and threatening to take uh, Russia to court. Again, a dispute here about what should be paid, how it should be paid, and Ukraine indicating on Thursday that it has the money to pay, that it's willing to pay, but by according to fair prices. Thanks, Roy. CCTV's Roy Ruttenberg there reporting from Kiev.